Willy Jan in Sarot Day, Melissa Shagnos is at the land, Yudishiot Koyakar at land, and Itini Anna Koyak Sinsiarin, artist at Curator Gogashna. Janan Kotan was at land. It's uh, good to see everyone here today. Um, I, I'm so excited to see, you know, new faces and old faces and friends from other lives. <laughs> I, uh, I really appreciate um, the support that we've received for this exhibit. Um, it is, it is, it has been such a, a learning experience for me, and uh, I think that um, a few years ago I thought that sort of my time with museums was over. <laughs> you know, uh, really struggling with um, institutional powers and. I think that working with the Folk Art Museum has showed me how those can bend and change and be malleable and, and also be uh, welcoming and listening to the work that I wanted to do. Uh, so, Chenan, thank you so much. Um, these are the amazing artists who are featured in this exhibition, and I am lucky enough to call each one of them a friend. Um, a brother, a sister, <laughs> and uh, I just want to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves. Um, and uh, we have a mic here, if you wanna turn it on, Joel, maybe. <laughs> and uh, I will, I'll hand it over. Um, but before we get started, uh, I did wanted to say too that there there is a lot of uh, Alaska Native and indigenous relatives in the audience today. And, um, this conversation we're gonna have is gonna feel very informal. Hopefully it will build on top of itself. And I just wanna encourage um, the Alaska Native or indigenous, indigenous audience members, if you have something to share, if you have, a, have, have something conflicting to share, <laughs> if you have something in agreement um, or, or in, uh, in some sort of teaching capacity. I, I just welcome you to raise your hand and I will keep an eye out on the audience um, because we want your voice heard in this as well. You know, so really want this to be a community conversation, you know, an indigenous Alaska Native community conversation. So we have a mic here that is portable so I can deliver it, but also I invite you um, whenever you have a thought to raise your hand, come up to the podium. <laughs> I know it's a podium, <laughs> but come up to the podium and, and speak and we'll get your lovely face lit and, you know, so, but, um, Anyways, yes, uh, we're going to head it, go ahead and get start and started. And I'm going to ask um, Golga here to introduce himself first. Hello, my name is Golga. I'm from Gasigal, Alaska, which is located in the southwest. And I've been producing art for the past nine years, ever since the start of my um, freshman year in high school. And I come from the Yupik. Do Kidley Tagashnish, Fedora Calendar Pennington, Shachita A. Gailatin, the Kaya Chakonit. Sharon Isaac Shunta, David Isaac Shukta, Lak Ayis, Denny Ina Shiji, Joel Isaac Ashtana Shiji, Kinai Shagu Shakaya Kailanda, Chinan Rili. So I introduced my, my grandmother. is from uh, Point Possession, which is just across the water from Anchorage, one of the spots where Captain Cook sent men ashore, but didn't actually go ashore himself. Um, and then my parents are Sharon and David Isaac. And my Denny Ina name is Lak Ayis, and my English name is Joel Isaac. And I live in Kenai, Alaska. Waka chinachit asiktoa alukovak. Hi everyone, my name is Alukovak. Found out today that uh, I'm Olga's grandfather. <laughs> my uh, my Yupik name from um, Peter Williams. There's a lot of Peter Williams, so to distinguish him, uh, it's Pitla because his wife couldn't say her er, her R's. And so found out that um, Lukovac was his grandfather uh, and was my great-grandfather. So um, I was born in Bethel. Uh, my family's from Akiak. I was raised in Sheetka, Sika, Alaska. A lot of my practice is about relationship with place and the materials that I use um, to create the artwork. 
I'm starting to get a little more into writing um, and education. Uh, Koyana. Ovanga Bobby Lynn Kalutakarak Brower, Utkaravi Milgorunga, Apara Gordon Brower Sr., Akara Mary Jane Avakana. Hi, I'm Bobby Lynn Kalutakarak Brower. Uh, I'm from Utkaravik, Alaska. I'm Inubak, and my parents are Gordon Brower Sr. and Mary Jane Avakana. Koyanak. Right. <clears throat> so like I said, this will be very casual. <laughs> so um, I've been spending time this last few days with all, all these people. And uh, I think that, that we'll just build upon our conversations. So I think what would be a good way to start is to uh, tell you a little story <laughs> about uh, Heather or <laughs> Helen Dick McLean. Um, who is, uh, was my first Denina language teacher and um, uh, someone that, an elder that uh, Joel works with a lot and is one of the amazing artists featured in the exhibition, um, The Bear Gut Parka. And uh, uh, I was doing an interview about her, um, or with her, about, about the parka and, you know, something that she said that really struck me and made me feel like a very deep connection uh, a deeper connection with Helen was that um, was just how much she loved the bears. You know, we're talking about this thing that she made. She made from from their intestines. You know, a, a, a bear gut parka, a raincoat, and you know, looking at it on 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 Zoom because it's pandemic times, <laughs> and uh, and and really just telling me, gosh, I just love those bears. I just love them so much, and. You know, it makes me think too that uh, not the whole world understands this. That um, part of what you see in the exhibition is is not just the love we have for each other and keeping each other warm, but it's like our intense love for the land and the animals that gave their life. And uh, this is something that I wasn't I wasn't born with. <laughs> this is knowledge that um, I had to learn from an, an emptiness I had in my heart and wanting to learn about my culture and, and really un starting to understand from elders and community that a love for your culture is a love for the animals and in turn is a love for yourself. And uh, everyone here I know has experienced at least maybe a version of this. <laughs> and uh, I think I'd like to start with, with maybe Bobby and, and how um, she started working on parkas and the reasoning behind that. So um, uh, maybe 19 years ago, um, I had my first daughter. And you know, it gets really cold up north um, in Utkalavik. In the winter, it averages negative 30 and with a minus 20 wind chill, so negative 50, and it's freezing out. And I wanted to keep my daughter warm. And that's how I started uh, skin sewing for my children to keep them warm. So I made her a, my mom actually brought home a fur parka from Wainwright that was partially finished, and it was muskrat. And I just fell in love with it. And I was like, okay, I can add on to this and make it larger for her when the time comes. But um, so I started skin sewing for my children. But my aunt, uh, we have a top of the world baby contest for traditional regalia, the all fur parkas. And she was like, we should, you should enter. You should learn how to, I want to teach you how to skin sew to make a fur parka. And so my aunt, uh, took me under her wing and I came over and we purchased all the skins that we needed and just um, the process of it, uh, finding the right skins and stretching them and making patterns and all of the patterns we make are um, handmade and usually they're uh, passed down from generation to generation so you can't um, pick up the patterns in a store. So. Uh, we used the traditional patterns, and um, then the trim design uh, 
the trim design really you get inspiration from. I looked back at my rel my ancestors' uh, trim design, so it's and I kind of like designed my trim work, the calfskin, and um, changed it up a little to make it my own. And then um, just putting it all together, it's a long process. It takes at least three to, I'd say at least six months when you're starting to get, learn how to make a fur parka. And um, I entered my first contest with my second oldest daughter. She's 16 now almost 17, but um, I entered her into the contest. She didn't place at the time, but um, I had been perfecting my skills over there. But by the um, by, my third child, my son, he had finally won, and I uh, was able to bring him to the World Eskimo Indian Olympics where you can compete at a higher level for the whole state, and he ended up winning uh, first place. So... <laughs> And just all the years of learning how to skin sew, uh, just it, the more you practice, the better you get. And eventually, um, in 2010, I started my own small business making traditional regalia and clothing for people. So it went from dressing and keeping my children warm into a business. And so it's, I love skin sewing. I've been doing it for a long time. I actually made my first, um, mittens and little toys when I was maybe 12 or 13. But my mother, was she taught me how to skin sew as well, and my dad's mother and her mother, so generations and generations of skin sewing. I think that was something that really moved me when I first was getting to know you, Bobby, is that, you know, you started with the birth of your of your children, you know, and that it was this extension of, like, love, and now it's turned into a business, right? And I've always struggled with that, this sort of idea of, of having sort of, like, my selling things, you know, and, and, and having that, but there is something really beautiful about making your life around sewing, making your, and now, you're doing all this work to teach so many people. I mean, you're an amazing teacher. During the pandemic, Bobby taught people to make an etiluk <laughs> on a print. She figured out how to do a printout pattern that was customizable for everybody, that they could print on their own computers and taught them to sew on a sewing machine over Zoom. <laughs> Can we clap? Yeah, right? <laughs> Um, so I'm just so continuously impressed by you. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, and it kind of makes me think a little bit of what Golga has been sharing um, about making parkas and then some of the activism around what you're doing. Do you think you could talk a little bit about that? All right, so I started skin sewing during my freshman year in high school. And the reason why I wanted to start skin sewing is because my family doesn't really pursue UP culture arts. Um, I'm pretty much self-taught, and I do a lot of observation around archives and objects throughout my community, what elders have. And I use my um, elders and my community as resources along with uh, Corporation over at Alaska as a resource. Because throughout those years, during the late 1980s, the, um, one of the corporations started to travel around villages to conduct these interviews from those elders that were born during the um, colonialism. And they held so much knowledge. And what they did with those um, interviews is that they archived them. And then after they archived them, they turned into books for our people to have access to them and you know learn from it. So when it came to parka making, um, none of my immediate extended family makes parka nowadays because it's too much time for them. And um, it takes years to make a parka. So one of the fancy parkas that I first made, it took me a year and a half to accumulate all those materials. And by the second year, I finally finished my first parka. And um, the way that I came up with that parka is that it came to my dream. I was gifted by one of the elders in my dreams um, during some sort of conference. And they called my name go, um, to go to the um, middle of the gym. And one of the elders were holding a, fa um, a fancy parka, a qalik, no, qulitak parka, known as story parka. 
And then from that, um, from that vision, that's when I created it. And around it, like, when I created the park, I thought of how can I educate my people that um, men can also sew? Because during the beginning of, you know, colonialism, majority of my people started to um, adopt American culture, you know, like such as oppression through sexism. Um, where men do men's stuff and women do women's stuff. And it was really restricted upon those um, those elders that were born during the colonialism um, era. So they were um, assimilated into Christianity, and that's how most of our cultural values and sewing skills were divided among men and women. So me as a Yupik artist, as a young emerging artist, I'm trying to educate and break the barrier for all indigenous youths to pursue art. It doesn't matter if wh whether what gender you come from. Um, one thing that matters is that you're going for your identity. You're educating yourself. You're starting your healing journey. And that's what I'm doing is by doing my self-research research through books, observations for arch through archives. And yeah, because no one in my family will initiate this, you know, Start of decolonizing, get, regaining your cultural identity. So that's where I'm at at the moment. And yeah. You know, something you said several things that are very important to touch upon, but, um, you know, talking about, you know, f that there's a generation uh, in our families that aren't sewing and aren't making parkas, aren't making garments you know, and about the effects of colonialism, the effects of, the continuing effects of settler colonialism, you know, and, you know, I just kind of think too that there's, people might ask why, you know, I, I had a couple questions, you know, being like, well, do people still, still wear parkas? Do they still make these things? I'm like, yes, they do. And they're like, every day, do they do it every day? And, and there's a, there's something in there, right? Because there's still like a belief that that isn't happening. And it is. It is happening, and I think that it's important to address because you know you have individuals like like these individuals here who are who are really creating. There's an activism in their creation, you know, of of sharing, and there's a vulnerability and and also like a great gift to everyone here for how much they're sharing, and. Um, you know, colonialism, it put in so many barriers for us to have access to hunting, barriers for us to have access to the time and the way of life and the, and the, the health and sustainable relationship we had with the land. You know, these barriers that, that prevent us from being able to sow every day, you know, and feed our families and take care of each other and take care of ourselves. And, you know, I just really want to um, lift up these individuals because they're finding ways to do that in a world that's not designed for that. So, um, yeah, but thank you for, for sharing that and making note to it. Um, you also talked about spending time in collections. And I've spent a lot of time in collections with and starting to be with, with relatives. I grew up with Joel. <laughs> Joel's um, a, a relative and a brother and someone I, I really consider important in my life. And I, I wonder if you would share maybe some of your experiences in collections, what that brings you, maybe what pains you, <laughs> and uh, yeah, how that might add to your practice. So I think the, the first time I researched collections was in Fairbanks. And there's Fran Reed as an artist who made large like uh, king salmon and other si other species of salmon, fishkin bowls that were not necessarily a traditional visual art form, but was uh, she worked with indigenous elders and then made it into her art practice and then taught people because salmon skin was being lost as a practice in Alaska. And so I went to the Museum of the North where I saw the, the Fran Reed Bowl and then the museum was like, you could come look at our collections. And they had a pair of mittens and a uh, a sewing kit and uh, a, a boot or two. And so I was able to look at those objects and look at the sewing patterns and the fishkin as a material. And it was a really amazing experience. And I hadn't been back to that, that was in 2010, 2011. And I just went back to that museum for the first time, looking at the collections uh, with a group of people 
uh, about in the last five weeks. And so it was interesting being back after like 13 years. And that was really the start of my journey of working in collections and seeing how well that institution worked with indigenous people to, to make them available. And that's not been my case at every institution that I've done research at. And um, thinking about some of the challenges there are to simply getting access and how far we have to travel. So Fairbanks is where I went to school. It's about a nine hour drive from where I live. So to me, it's really close. Just pop up. I've, I've done day trips. So it's like, you just pop up, have a meeting and drive home. So it's the, like 20 hours of driving for two hours of work. So I'm like, that's close. But to go to the lower 48 or to go to Europe where all the stuff that's captured and held hostage in Russia and the Kunstamirna, it's like, we can't get to that. And it's been, and I say captured and held hostage because they've refused to let it come back to the US even to visit. And so it's like, how do we see that? They have the largest collection of Dena'ina objects, our material relationship in the world, in one location, and we can't get to it. And so part of that, that journey um, for me is, the goal for me for working in collections is to make those material, those relational objects part of our lives again so that no one can hold us hostage. Because it's like, we know how to make that stuff. It's just, we, that the objects there are from like the 1700s or early 1800s, it's the oldest kind of at contact time point. And so that's part of, for me, when I think of collections, that's part of my goal for that. I've brought in Helen McLean, um, who has the Barricut Parka. She and I have gone to collections and looked at objects. And I love going with her and other elders because they'll pick up stuff and like beat on drums and like, let's fold this and like, see how this is flexible? And like, let's see how strong these are and stretch things. And the conservators are like going pale and about to pass out. And it's like, yeah, so. But that's what those objects and those materials were designed to do. And they can still do that. And they last longer if they're actually used in a way. Because they're relate it's a relationship. And so us visiting collections is a really impor important part of doing conservation. Um, I have a, started out with a BS in chemistry and got halfway through that degree. So I'm like, the science nerd in me is like, let's do spectroscopy. So I'm all for conservation, but there's also the spiritual connection and the relationship connection to conservation. And so I think about those kinds of things that I've learned in collections and sometimes it can be very intense. And then, then it's taking that knowledge and bring it back home into our, through teaching. And just thinking a little bit dovetailing to what Gogo was sharing, I learned how to hunt from Helen. So I learned from, from a grandmother how to hunt, which is traditionally in the Judeo-Christian world a male thing. And then I learned how to sew from my grandmother and from Helen. And I teach men and women how to sew as well. And so it's, it's work, it's, it's our life way. And there are practices that we do that might be more associated with one, I'm gonna air quote, gender or the other, as far as, but they're not these things that we have to like, oh, you can't do that. You can't touch a needle because you're a male. I'm like, that's insane. Um, <laughs> As far as like, that's a nice way of putting it from talking with elders in my life. Um, they would have stronger language to describe that than, than I just said for insanity. So those are just some of the things about collections and decoding like why these things aren't done anymore. And there's this commodification of elitism that happens where like we have the only thing of this in the world. And it's like, well, why do you have it? And why is there only one? because we used to all have them in our lives everywhere. And then to, like what Will said, get those questions like, well, do you still do this all the time? And it's like, well, you have the one in the world. So it's hard if we like, so that, that's part of the taking back from collections. Like we're just gonna make them and then use them. And so that, that's just part of the, some, of the, some of the collections things that I think about. And really the other piece is pushing back um, against some of the institutional ways of the, the people are trained. And sometimes it can be a pretty, a pretty stiff, like no, this is inappropriate. And other times, and you have to put a boundary because it's extracting live human beings. Like I'm still a person, you can't collect me and put me behind glass, like no thank you. Um, and then other times you start to form relationships where the institutions and the people in the institution are learning and trying to shift. 
And so there's this, this piece about, for me, I found there are some institutions that I don't work with because I'm like, I don't have the energy to fight that. And it's a person that's hiding behind a degree or a, a name on a building. And so I'm like, Helen just turned 78. I have minimal amounts of time with her. I'm not gonna waste my energy fighting this institution that really has something that we need to see. So I'm gonna go someplace else where we have good relationships. And then sometimes by doing that, it softens up and we can go in through a different kind of softened relationship. So there's, it's intense. So that's just some thoughts on, on how, to, how to navigate that minefield. <laughs> Shannon Segu, um, you know, I, you brought up something that's uh, brought something, a thought to my mind that I think needs to be repeated, is that there is an elitism, you know, within institutions that having the only Denina quiver, maybe, um, that is painted in this way, that has these things in this way, is, uh, is by design, you know, it's creating um, wealth and uh, an, an elitism and a hierarchy by destroying our cultures and the ways that we could have those things and the ways that all of us had those things. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that and I just want to reiterate that. <laughs> um, I also want to say something too that uh, Joel has been my teacher in so many so many ways and um, so all of you up here are teachers and uh, you know kind of how we're talking about this sort of dynamic of power and you know I, I thought maybe we could talk to look of luck about some of your teaching and some of the focuses of your teaching today uh, <laughs> I know you've taught about fish skin but I know you've also taught about activism and indigenous politics and decolonization and also the the hollowness of using decolonization as a as a term yeah, Guyana. Um, no, I, I'd like to, I think maybe I'll start a little bit and then maybe stop and so that you can pull out a little bit more of what you want. Because I've taught a, a broad range of things from um, hunting uh, marine mammals to like processing and skinning them um, to tanning them, in particular seal and sea otter. Um, I've taught working with fish skin, um, taught hand sewing with different kinds of fur uh, from seal and sea otter to, to beaver, um, even land otter. And then also, I think teach, um, some of this was kind of talking about in decolonizing, um, developing a curriculum a few, I was gonna say a few years ago, I think it's been longer than that. But uh, my partner on the project, Michael Dempster, we've been creating uh, a curriculum, Harvest Kuarchik, based off of this documentary film that we made around the kind of contemporary use of sea otter hunting. And we developed uh, seven lessons to accompany the film. And like the first lessons on environmental racism. Um, and then the last lesson is about allyship, but in there there's also like indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous science like versus Western science. And there's also like a lesson about climate change and how climate change is impacting sea otters. And then there's also a lesson about population dynamics of sea otters. So it covers a wide range of things as well as like what the Marine Mammal Protection Act is um, and the exemption for that act for Alaska natives and a lot of the problematic nature um, of that exemption. And so the film was created and the curriculum's created based off of this ongoing kind of experience that I've had with working with seals and sea otters and practicing my culture and talking about it and how important, like in particular it is to like my life, how it like saved my life, um, where I was really close to taking my own life and was trying to do so through uh, alcohol and other drugs. And I like, at the time, would describe myself as like maybe agnostic, um, but, I, but I prayed and I asked creator to, to like give me something to help 
because I knew I was about ready um, to die. And, um, and it took a while. Like, by that I mean maybe three months, which grand scheme of things isn't. But um, I, I kind of hit bottom, so to speak. And I moved back home. And so prior to that, I was doing a lot of sea otter hunting and seal hunting and slowly kind of like finding myself and my culture and my ancestry through that. Um, and initially like trying to start that in the context of how do I support myself as a visual artist? So I knew like the economic history of sea otter based off of the colonial American and British fur trade of sea otter. And so I thought that it would be kind of easy um, to make a living through that way. And it turns out it's, it's incredibly difficult. <laughs> and, and a lot of that difficulty is um, the implicit racist bias of settler colonialism. And so within trying to like talk about what I do and why and how important it is to me and how it like connects me to my father when I was raised outside of the culture and didn't know my father past when I was like a baby and who died when I was at a young age. Um, and then also I found this just this connection to creator and all, and all life. Um, and, that, and that was like a long journey throughout like years. Um, but I discovered that most people outside of Alaska didn't know that marine mammal hunting in Alaska is happening. Most people don't know that it's legal. Most people don't know our customs and our practices. And with that, they also don't know like the population levels. Most people think that their sea otters are endangered, which they're not. They're not listed as endangered under the US Endangered Species Act. Um, the California sea otter stock, which is the Southwest sea otter, which isn't currently being hunted, um, which is also another, another problematic issue with the exemption in the Marine Mammal Protection Act is only for Alaska natives. It doesn't recognize the inherent right of all the indigenous peoples across like the US and US territories that lived on the coast and have had uh, an immense deep relationship with marine mammals for thousands upon thousands of years. So it only recognized the Alaska Native one. Um, the definitions of what, it, like what is Alaska Native is also problematic. I'll save that. <laughs> Maybe we can talk about it later, but I'll, I'll move on. Um, and so created this curriculum to, um, to try to educate and inform people. Um, and so currently I'm teaching it. Uh, we've got about another week left at Bennington College in Vermont. Um, I was teaching some other things as well, um, but I'm gonna pause right there to see if that's like answering your question of um, my work teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, impressive, right? <laughs> you know, I think uh, me asking you that question was really I think you've you've taught me a lot too over mm -hmm. the years, and and what you've shared, um, you know, in connection to the animals, and um, I think that that relationship changes over time. You know, what you shared up here was a vast experience of life, <laughs> right? Um, and I think that maybe that's something I want to open it up to anybody to talk about is like how our relationships change to the land, the animals, and also to how we process things in our art. And yeah, so if you want to share, I know Golga, we talked about how you started, you know, working on parkas, but then also um, about what you see in your future. Uh, and Joel, you're, you shared how, you know, you might not make another moto jacket for another 20 years, but what was, then what was the point of making this one? What did that do for you? You know, so just a couple thoughts. If anybody would like to has a would like to share. I'll I'll jump in. Um, I think just like reflecting on the conversation that we're having and in in spaces where what we experience as indigenous people on a daily basis and like an hourly basis, like think about every time you want to eat food. Just think like that's the interval of time that we experience some of the the hard topics that we're talking about and calling out either the the inadequacies in our current Western systems. It's that often. And when we're having the conversation 
I feel like the 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 some of the structures around I mean, I'm a linguist as well and like English argumentative patterns and the way that language functions and, the, and like university trans people is designed to be argumentative and one winner. So it's it's a subtractive kind of process. You start out with let's say five people and then you get three and then you get two and then you get one. When we're talking about being in relationship and working with each other and having artistic practices and communities, it's additive. And so by us being minimized into who is the most elite and has the like that one thing that you made, it it shifts the whole way of thinking about it. And it creates a combative, it can create a combative kind of conversation because it is two diametrically opposed worldviews. And so I think one of the things, like when I'm out on the land or I'm in the water, I've been hooligan fishing until like 9.30 before I drove to Anchorage at 2 a.m. and I'm like in the water. And it's like 40-ish degrees and 50 degrees outside. Um, and I'm just in the water in shorts, a sweatshirt, and like toe shoes. And one of the things that like Osgood, who's an ethnographer, documented about the people from my grandmother's village where I'm from, is that we don't wear boots in the water. And I'm like, I don't wear boots in the water. I don't own waterproof boots. All of my boots have holes in them because I don't wear them in water. I wear them for walking through the woods. And so they get cut up with sticks and stuff. So it's just thinking about the relationship for me with land and water and our, our animal relatives or fish relatives it's, I'm, I'm in it, I feel it. And thinking about the, the fish skin and the connection with salmon, uh, it happened last, it was a really interesting experience last summer for me. I was, we were dip netting, it was the last day. Dip netting is a highly regulated process. There's about 10,000 people that come to a mile of beach um, from across the state in my hometown and leave a ton of trash. And um, it's just fairly traumatic, especially on the weekends because it, we're accessible by the road. And it's, uh, we have some of the largest red salmon in the world. Um, and so it's just, lots of people come to fish. And it was the last day of dip netting. Everyone had limited it out, pretty much, who'd come in. And so there were only about 40 people on the beach. And there's this thing, like our traditional nets are made out of wood, so they float. And I use a copper ring and a wooden net so it floats. And I generally swim out in the water and then I swim back to shore. Um, and when the fish are really close, you just walk out and you're just like up to your like, uh, heart basically in water. And I was in the water and I had the nets floating and I have it just, I'm holding onto a rope so it's just loosely floating in the water. And I had my hands open and the fish were coming up and they were not, like if, if you had a dog that comes up or a cat and like nuzzles your hand, it's like pet me and does the little like head thing. The fish were doing that like to my hands, like slowly, because fish can go really fast, but they were slowing down and they were just kind of like nuzzling my hands. And it was a really amazing experience, like flowing around my body, which is different because the fish also will run into you and then they're startled and you're startled because there's, you can't see the water, it's very glacial silt filled and they hit you and then they're flopping and you're like, wah, because you don't, there's also sharks in the water and skates and manta rays and like, like things with barbs that can get you. And so it's like, what is this thing in the water that's gonna come up and get you? And so there's the startling moment, totally not that. The fish were definitely coming to me and like to the net. And I was like, I would put in the net and just like, like walk in, walk out. And there was a fish like every time. And there on the other side of the river, there were people, no one was catching fish. And there were only 20,000 fish that went up the river that day. And I've never had that experience, but it's like part of the thing you gotta be careful of is when you sing fish welcoming songs in multiple languages, all the fish came. And it was like, wow, that like, it was that, that piece of relationship of like welcoming the fish home. And that kind of connection where it's like, these, it's, it's a different kind of way that we have, like you can think about dogs, cats, pets that we have in our life, that kind of relationship. So there's just a story about, about fish and that's the kind of piece that I feel like when we walk into the gallery, that's what I sense in that space from across the whole state. And so that, that's part of the power of this show is I think it reads that way. I feel that for me. So, Shania. Shania Jules. <laughs> Um, something, I've heard that story and I love that story. <laughs> Cause like, I, I also think too that it's important for, I think it's important for the world to know and something that I think we understand and people relatives understand in the audience is that um, 
you know, as much as, as we are, you know, celebrating the parka makers, uh, the whole natural world that we're part of, but the animals, the plants, the land are aware of us too. And so we also need to be really careful on how we exhibit things and how we show them an exhibition and be very considerate of that, you know, and um, I haven't talked to Laura or Lily or Susie about this, but I, but I also too, um, and hope that this is shared out that uh, for indigenous relatives and Alaska Native relatives that is there, if there's things that need to be changed or things that need to be addressed or thought about later in this exhibition, you know, that that is an open door for people to, to give us that feedback, right? And I think, I don't speak for everyone, but um, I know for me, I would wanna hear that from Alaska Native and Indigenous relatives because this is all about a process of change, you know, and about trying to do better and trying to improve more. And, um, I, I, cause I feel in, in some ways that having an exhibition that is so indigenous centered can be a form of advocacy and activism. Doesn't always hit, doesn't always address what it needs to because we are all at different times in our lives um, and different experiences. But uh, I just wanna say that too. So um, is there anything else that people feel compelled to share? Yeah, in regards to like process. So I spoke earlier about, um, I guess like the correlation of how my art practice and in particular working with seals and sea otters was a part of like, my healing journey as well. Um, and so when I would initially kind of talk at museums, guest lecture at colleges, I would talk about the healing component with what I do in regards to my identity. But the longer that I did it, what I realized is the healing component is not so much about my identity, but it was the realization of how connected and a part of life that I am. In particular, this case was like sea otters. So as for an example, like being kind of known as the sea otter hunter, this kind of identity of being in media or giving lectures as an artist who works with them, but also having like the hides that need to be tanned in my freezer and having hides that are already tanned in my house and having projects that are finished, projects that are unfinished projects that like are currently set down and like have a needle in them um, to me eating, you know, the animal too. Um, and also it's how I pay for the lights to turn on. And so then I had this realization of where do I begin and the sea otter ends? And I, and I couldn't make any distinction of that. And, and that can be said, I think, for just like everything. Um, but for me, it was very clear in that context um, with marine mammals. And so also on that journey, when I started out hunting is quite difficult. There's times when hunting is quite difficult for me. Um, and then there's times where it's not. And I guess what I'm particularly saying is not the context of the weather or trying to, trying to see where the animals are. What I mean is in the context of, of killing. Um, at times that can be very difficult for me. And in the beginning it was. Um, but, the, but the act of harvesting and hunting was so meaningful for me that I continue to do it. And then I started to implement the traditional practices of asking the animal for its life, um, using this water bottle to give it its last drink of water, which is rooted in Yupik custom, so that the, the spirit will come back to the hunter. Um, and smudging and doing other practices. And seeing that happen, you know, and like asking an animal for its life, and, I, and I've seen it give itself to me. And then there's times where I ask the animal for its life and just like that it's gone and I don't see it again. Um, and so really understanding that and respecting that and having that, I guess, period of time where I was like hunting two to three times a week, week after week, 
month after month, year after year. And that had me so connected and in tune with the world in a way that is even really hard for me to describe. Um, because you, you really just have to like live it <laughs> and experience it. Um, without diving too deep or trying to incriminate myself, it's close to a psychedelic experience. Um, and, I, and I think that that's kind of in a way like talking with a friend and kind of making fun of hipsters and, you know, like Brooklyn, you don't need a microdose with mushrooms in order to be like connected with everything, you just need to be connected. Um, and so that's, that's what it was for me, um, for, that, for that process. And so it is also a journey. And so like I share that in the context of the process of kind of where I'm kind of beginning in it, where it has kind of led me. Um, so there's also a really wonderful film. There's a series of films that individuals are featured in, uh, in the theater of the exhibition. And um, the one that I'm particularly moved by is, is Bobby's. And, um, you know, you talk about the parka. Being kind of an identity, or at least part of a, a way to be proud of that. And you speak about it in such an eloquent way. And talking about sort of the parka competitions and the trade fair competitions, like, can you talk about why sharing that with your indigenous community is, is why that's important to you? So um, I guess parka making uh, really connected me to my culture. To me, it's um, when I skin sew, it's really, it's like medicine. Um, it really helps me connect and just being able to, you know, there aren't a lot of parka makers and um, being able to represent my people and just being proud of where I come from when I was young. Um, being native, like, it wasn't cool. And when I got older, I was just, like, so tired of that. Um, mindset. And I was like, I want to make, you know, I want our younger generation to believe in themselves. I want them to love who they are because our culture is so beautiful and people need to see that. And I think that's why I create so much and the parkas I make, like I went from traditional fur parkas to making really contemporary pieces and just um, having to kind of mix traditional and contemporary, where you can wear these every single day, because the fur parkas that you see were always for, you know, that's all we had back, my ans our ancestors had back then. But now, you know, we have all these, um, you know, you can go to the store and buy all your clothing and coats, but, like, um, I just wanted it to be, you know, a cool thing for our youth and for them to love who they are because they're they're so special. Our people are so special and, you know, I want them to know that and I want to, you know, that's why I do what I do. I do fashion shows because I want our children to believe in themselves that they can do anything and just to really embrace their, our cultures, you know, it's just so important and there's such a right, uh, high rate of suicide. And um, for me, I really think that's because the disconnect, a lot of people aren't connecting to our culture. And when I was a middle school teacher for a year up in Utkarvik, um, I had six, seventh and eighth graders and I had, um, I was teaching them skin sewing and language and these boys, uh, they were the worst the biggest bullies in school, they were so bad, they would get sent home all the time. And I got these boys to sit down in class and make a hat. I had them make a hat and I couldn't believe 
the difference in these kids. It was like 180. It was like, who are you? You're just sitting here, <laughs> like, behaving. And just, it was so amazing to see the difference that just being immersed, doing cultural things, what it can do to a person. But, yeah, that's, that's why I do what I do. <laughs> Um, gosh, thank you so much, Bobby. Uh, yeah, I'm just so impressed by you and just in awe of you. You're such an amazing person. All of you are. Um, and I, I'd like to give the last word to Golga. We've talked about uh, a lot of your future plans and how you're making parkas and then also controlling your image, you know, through photography and and the things that you're doing. So I would just, I just love to, you know, you have such a bright future. I'm excited to hear about it. <laughs> cool. yeah. um, so as a big artist, um, well, as they were telling stories, that's when I kind of related to what they were speaking about, you know, being as a younger generation and exper experiencing a lot of, a lot of hardship. Um, for mine, it was um, the Western identity, like, I questioned myself so many times of who I am, like, well, what am I doing here? Like, of why am I living here? And then throughout the years of like, you know, learning about Yupi culture, the more I learned about it, the more I began to understand who I am and who I wanted to be. And from that, like, grabbing a needle and a thread and fur and starts producing project, that's when I started to understand, this is Yupi culture, this is what my ancestors used to do. I'm here because of them. Uh, we are here because of our ancestors are strived through so much genocide, so much, you know, in, in, um, inequality. So to, um, to this day, it came to my sense that cultural art saved my life as a Yupik emerging artist. Because, you know, as a teenager, I went through puberty and it feels like, you know, it was challenging. And understanding the concept of culture identity really helped me and strived me towards, you know, advocating myself and my f students. I'm a high school teacher. I never really thought of becoming a, becoming a high school teacher. And this is my second year of teaching. And um, when I first started te teaching, that's when I, I didn't know how to teach. Like, th there was a curriculum book right there. And like, most of the time I would let my students just write down anything. <laughs> so it was a challenge of teaching. But then before, before I got into teaching, I told myself, I have the opportunity to, ch to change the younger generation. I have the opportunity to inspire others to pursue, to research, to conduct, and gather information about their identity. I want them to explore. I want to influence others. I want them to you know, keep this culture identity alive for the future generations to strive on because cultural art can actually save lives. Cultural art can actually um, let a person, meaning not letting the mind talk a lot, but more like letting the mind work its hands on an object, a piece, and create a masterpiece out of it. So every time when I create an art piece, every time when I create a parka for the first time or the second time, um, I tend to tell stories of the back of my head of how my ancestors used to live, of how they used to be innovative, of how they used to be strive, um, striving through the day because, you know, back in those days, they didn't have technology. They really, they were on survival mode each day. And like one of the artists mentioned that um, it is not for, you know, the, um, the uh, parka itself, but it's also creating love, a bond between a mother and a child, or a father and a child, or a mother and a spouse. Um, a lot of skin sinistresses back in those days during ancestral times used to depend, depend on materials. They wanted to make their loved ones clothing so that they can stay warm, so, so then they can feel loved. So then the whole aspect of cultural art is an important factor to my life, and it's one of the things that I want to influence the younger generation to, you know, pursue, because I want to make change for the future generations. Goyana.
Um, so that is our talk for today. Uh, before we leave, though, I, I'd like um, Holly Nordlum and Alana and Michelle to stand up. Or I think Michelle might have just stepped out. Um, Holly Nordlum <laughs> uh, created a, a beautiful a beautiful mural you'll see on the entrance and some of the graphic stuff. And I also want to recognize uh, Alana Jones here. Um, Alana's amazing parka maker. I'm learning, learning so much more about you through this trip. Um, but Alana is here representing her mother, Mary Lou Sowers, who passed away uh, in the creation of this exhibition. And we're so honored that she's here, um, you know, keeping her memory with us. So thank you, Alana. Uh, and Chinan Sagu to all the artists for making the trip, for doing the labor, and um, and for being vulnerable with us. I really appreciate it. So, Chinan, and enjoy the show. <laughs>